and those that are online with us. Can we give the Lord a big hand of praise? Amen. God is good. You know, I love when you have issues before you start service because that makes your worship greater. That makes everything better because out of the midst of frustration, you're worshiping God. So it ups the value instead of hindering it. Yeah. And for those online that don't know what we're speaking about, it is about 12 after. We like to start on time, but the PA system keyboard would not work. Something happened to it and some things got unplugged or what have you, but we got to come back together. We welcome you to join us and those that are here. Can we stand before the Lord and just invite him tonight? Thank you for coming and for being a part of uh, the service good. Christian had some powerful, powerful worship going on before service started and I'm thinking, wow, I just want to say, let that song play a hundred times over. But God is so good to us. We thank you so much for being here. Are we alright? Okay. <laughs> He's trying to keep the keyboard. We almost asked, do you want to play a guitar tonight? But, um, anyway, let's pray. Father, come and pray. For the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your great mercy and your goodness. Thank you for who you are and who we are. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your love. I ask you, God, in Jesus' name, that you would minister the word tonight. Worship. Lord, how Caleb tonight as he leads us, Father, we move past the blunders of our PA system wires things. Tonight is your night. Lord, we honor you. We're here for one reason, not for a social gathering, although this fellowship. But we're here to lift up the conscious.
If I sing it, I might just destroy it. I'm not sure if I got the right tune.
Sorry, I think I just threw the whole worship design out of whack. I apologize, but I don't apologize for the words. Can we give Jesus a big hand of praise? <laughs> oh, thank you, Caleb. I was thinking, don't you just enjoy his voice? I mean, the singers are good. Everyone's good. But this, this guy is just, uh, I just amazes me. I'm just listening as he was worshiping. It's, man, God, what a gift. What a gift. Thank you, ladies. Beautiful job. I love their worship. I love when they all sing before the Lord. Amen. Can we give Jesus one more hand of praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. Sorry for my rendition of that song. It's a joyful noise. It says, have thine own way. And I want you to listen, because I'm going to go right into the word with this. I, have, I, I feel like this is an unusual message tonight. Um, I usually have some revelation in the scriptures that God has shown me. And I want to say this. This isn't a, a revelation of a hidden thing in the scriptures. This is just something that we as God's children should know. But we don't see. It's right in front of us. How many know sometimes there's things right in front of us, front of us and we don't even see it? And that's what happened to me in this song. I just want to share this with you. It says, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You are the potter and I am the clay. Yeah. Mold me and make me after thy will. Wow. Thank you, Everyone say, wow. 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 I am waiting, yielded, and still. I want to open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to read just a couple of scriptures tonight. Matthew, chapter 6. And we're going to start around verse 5, and normally I would go into the Lord's Prayer that we all so uh, are so familiar with. But I want to read to you some of the portion before that. We're going to read verse 5 to 8, Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 5 to 8. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, when that's your motive, you've received your reward. I added that little part there. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father, which is in secret. And your Father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not like them, for your Father already knows, I added the word already, what things you need of even before you ask. How many know that God knows everything we need before we ask? Yeah. He does. Yeah. And so he's saying, don't get into vain repetitions. Go into the prayer place. Shut the door. Get alone with God. If you're doing it to be seen of others, then that is already your reward. And he says, but if you do it in the secret place, and I spoke about this the other day, that he will reward us openly. And I had this thought in my mind, I'm going to go to John chapter 4, and I didn't even want to go here because I've read out of this so much, but I, I just felt like I needed to. This is an unusual way to do this because I'm going to bounce around a little bit. But we often pray in our prayer life, for people, for places, for situations, we often pray for our nation. How many know that all you have to do is watch the news a little bit and you have a mile long prayer list? Uh, we have so much to pray for right now as a people that we could spend hours in prayer 
petitioning heaven. And I want to say this, that that's not the only way God wants us to pray. So we find ourselves sometimes praying for people, for places, for situations, for uh, uh, our friends, for our family, or for nations, or for the church, or a variety of things. And I wrote this down, but how often do we just wait on Him? I want to say this. What is his expectation of our time with him in prayer? You ever think about that? What is his expectation of our time with him in prayer? It's pretty simple. If you hang out with someone enough, you know their habits. You know the way they do things. You know, we, we have a... Uh, a, a crew of my, my paint business, we've had a crew of three to four men for years. And they could go on a job and they didn't even have to talk. They just knew what the other person was going to do because they were with them so often. And God knows that too in the area of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Are you hearing me? So he knows what our prayer life is like before we even start it. And please forgive me, I'm going to be a little bit sarcastic here, but I wonder if he ever looks at us and says, no, they're praying again. <laughs> because sometimes uh, in the mindset that we have, we don't realize what he would really like us to be doing. And we find ourselves in tremendous repetition. How many in here join me and say, I prayed the same thing over and over and over again. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not exactly talking about that, but sometimes our prayer life just gets plain out boring. Sometimes our prayer life is just something we got to get through to, get it done so that we can make sure we cleared all the areas in our life with God. Are, are you hearing me? Well, I spent my 20 minutes in prayer and my 20 minutes in the Word. Okay, let's go do it. And it's almost in a repetitious form of a, a routine or ritual. And I think sometimes in that mindset, we're thinking we've really got his attention. I'm going to go in there and me and God are going to read the word and we're going to have a prayer time and God is saying, mm, yeah, I can quote it word for word before you even start. Are you hearing me? I know it's stinging a little bit on this, but I want to show you something that the Holy Spirit began to speak to me this afternoon. In a more direction of what He wants from us more than what we're giving to Him. Are you hearing me? So, I wrote this down. What is His expectation of our time with Him? His expectation will be whatever we're in the habit of doing until we break that habit. Now, I want to go on to another section and come back. John chapter 4. If I can find John chapter 4 in my Bible. Verse 4, chapter 4. And he said, or, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then came he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the partial ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat on the well as it was about the sixth hour. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me the drink. For his disciples were gone away. He asked him, would you give me a drink? The woman said of Samaria unto him, how is it that you being the Jew is asking me for anything? You guys don't have no dealings with us. Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Amen. Now this is pretty awesome. I love this story. It's one of my favorites in the Bible. Because when I speak about it, I always speak about the timing of God. Have you ever thought about the timing of God? Um, I wrote this over on the side. It, it, some of you haven't been in the book of Daniel. But uh, there's a 70 years of 
weeks prophecy or 490 years. And it said those years, and this is prophecy, those years are going to start when they rebuild Jerusalem and they're going to stop seven years short when Jesus Christ is hung on the cross and dies. And there will be seven more years to be fulfilled. And guys, that is the time of the tribulation. So it's kind of weird. God has such timing that it's perfected in everything he does. And so the timing of him to show up at a well on a 22-mile trip. Sister Tammy and I were coming back from Slide Out the other day. I was driving about uh, 78 miles an hour. And we're coming from Slide Out. It took about 15 minutes or so. We're home. And I said, you know, if we lived in the horse and buggy time, now, my mind really goes berserk sometimes. You know, I never do that. I mean, it's like my mind does not shut off. So I'm driving down the road, and I typed in. Well, no, I spoke. Excuse me. I don't text and drive. I talk and drive. So I hit the little button and said, how fast does a horse walk? <laughs> and by the time I was done calculating, I can't remember, but it was a long trip to get from, I think it was like over eight hours to get from Pearl River to Picayune. And that's if it was just a straight period. And I said to her, wow, how time has changed. So I'm, I'm thinking about Jesus on a 22-mile journey to sit on a well because he's tired. And the precise moment a woman is walking up to get water. Tell me the timing of God is incredible. Amen. I've gone back and I've looked over my life and the lives of many that I know and love and care about. And the timing of God is so incredibly set in order that it is staggering. Do you know that if the sun was a little closer, we would die? I think it was a little further, we'd freeze. You know, if the axis of the, the earth was just tilted a little bit more, it'd be an absolute disaster. You ever think about gravity and how all these things work? God is a perfectionist in what he does. The timings of how he does everything, he has a specific time, and he has a timing in the church. Now, this past Sunday, a unique uh, set of circumstances happened. And if you were here, you got to just watch God in the work. When I'm standing over here and the Lord begins to tell me something about our precious Renee. And, and I speak and then God's confirming it. And I speak and God's confirming it. Then God tells me, you know, it's time for an altar call. I'm going to move in someone's life. And, and uh, the next thing you know, she says God told her to give an altar call. And I'm thinking, wow, God, you're really revealing. And it's all about the timing. Shauna, am I allowed to share? I'm going to just share in, um, for you and Adam, I'm going to share this in a form of code, but not directly. But she told me at her wedding, before the wedding, she said, God spoke to me that he is going to touch two areas of people's lives during the wedding. And she said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but I, I really want someone to pray over those areas. So I just said, well, I'm going to put it right in the middle of this thing. We're going to pray over those areas. And I want you to know something. She got a report that in a total unexpected way that God came after the prayer was presented and ministered to a family from that prayer. Not because Pastor David Meeks prayed and not because of anything except God said to Shauna, pray over this, I'm going to move. I was obedient to not even to God. I'm being honest. I was obedient to the word that God gave her. And when I spoke it, I said, okay, God, let's see what you do. And she just shared with me, her and Adam, just a few minutes ago, how God had intervened in somebody's life. You see, it's the timing that is so incredible with God. You can be driving down the road and pull off somewhere, and the timing is you just can't even explain it except for it must be God. I think every one of you have some stories that are tremendous. I'll tell you one that's real quick and I won't get into too much detail. Many years ago, 
Many years ago, my brother was living in New Orleans with my father, and he uh, loved to play basketball. And so he goes to Central Park to play basketball. And there's really uh, not many people there. And he's shooting some hoops, we used to call it then. And there's a young lady standing on the side. So my brother was kind of a ladies' man. You know, he, he, he liked the girls. He went on many dates. The cool thing about it is he'd bring them on a date and pull over on the side of the road and get them saved. So he did a lot of that type of stuff, too. It's pretty awesome. So he walks over. He's just a friendly guy. My brother's friendly. He used to say, well, this is my brother that's not friendly, and I'm the friendly one. Because I didn't talk a lot, and he was ready to talk to everybody. So he walks over and starts talking with a young woman. And, you know, she's standing there. And next thing you know, she lights up a cigarette. He had no idea that he was being set up. The next thing he knows... He was punched in the throat. He was thrown down. Handcuffs put on him. They were beating the fool out of him. My brother had walked into a setup. Some guy was calling and making obscene phone calls to the young lady who happened to be a police officer's girlfriend. Said, meet me at the park. And my brother just happened to walk right into the middle of this <laughs> timing of disaster. They handcuffed him and... I, I'm not, I, I don't want to be too mean, but if you go back several years, the New Orleans Police Department had a real bad reputation. I mean, real bad. And uh, so they put him in the back seat. The guy in the front seat, the driver, kept reaching back and punching him in the face. And then at one point, he makes a statement, and then they start choking him. So now he is literally dying. The last words he heard before he started disappearing was, you better stop, you're killing him. He remembered crying out to God, and they said, you pervert, don't cry out to God. But you see, they were mistaken, and when you know God, you know God. Amen. So he's crying out to God for help. And, and so finally, they released him. He said he literally saw his life flash before his eyes. And I, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but I think he saw a lot of the sin in his life was blacked out. And the things that he saw, I think, might have been missed opportunities that God had showed him of his life where he should have done what the Lord wanted, something like that. And then he comes to the place where they stop at the police department in New Orleans. They open the doors of the car, and they all get out and leave him back there by himself. Now, there was serious police brutality back in those days, much worse than it is now, much worse. And you have to wonder, why did they leave the doors open? Maybe for him to run? Nobody knows. But he was one calling on God. So he steps out of the car, gets ready to do what you know. I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to take me to the bayou or something because they're not taking me into the police department? And so he gets ready to run. He gets his feet out of the car and stands up, and something pulls him back in the car and says, don't run. You knew who that someone was. And so from that point, He's sitting there, and the officers go inside, and the one guy calls the mother-in-law and says, Hey, we caught that pervert. He's in the back of the car. And she says, That's not possible. He just got done calling the house. <laughs> Talking about the timing of a God that said, Meet the, the pervert. The guy abuser said, meet me in the park. And instead of meeting her at the park, he calls her house. That doesn't make any sense. Except God. So they come back and they apologized. And, you know, he told them, I don't have no malice towards you, although my singing voice is damaged now. And, and he took him years to get over it. It was really bad. They damaged his vocal cords. He led worship for years. Still does. Powerful man of God. And 
They talk, he talked to them about the Lord. And then he left. My father goes to the police department because my dad was just a dad, you know, six foot four, 290 pounds. And, he, you know, in his younger age, he was not that good of a guy. Thank God he got saved. Thank God that the bloodline that I'm in is washed by Jesus or it'd be a whole lot worse. And he went in there and he says, tell me, I want to see these police officers. Well, sir, they don't work for us. We don't have any idea who you're talking about. What a crazy situation. My point is the timing of God reached right in there and spared his life, I believe. Are you hearing me? How many accidents have been missed or situations have been missed or a certain delay saves? I mean, we could go on for a thousand years describing the timing of God from our personal lives to the scriptures where he just lines things out one thing after another. And we don't even understand it. I mean, think about this. Before the foundation of the world, he had planned for Jesus to come when Jesus came. The date Jesus was born, God already set that in place because he knew the people that would be there in that season and time. Before the foundation of the world, he already picked Peter, James, and John, and Judas, and the rest of them. He already knew. God's entire operation of his kingdom is set in a mode of his timing. Are you with me? Amen. I hope I'm not boring you because I'm going to make a shift here in just a minute. Jesus himself said this, I do nothing except for that which I see the Father do. We know that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. The timing of his ministry was incredible. Everything he did had one, two, three, and four purposes because it was all designed by God. Has everybody got that? I'm trying to just hammer that in our head. The timing of God. The timing of your salvation, the timing of your deliverance, the timing of your healing, the timing of you walking in this building here was a setup by God. Come on, let's give him a hand of praise. We can do that, Brad. Thank you. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. Out of all the timings of the Lord, oh, before I share it, I'm going to go. Let's go to Isaiah 40 and read that, and I'll finish this off. Isaiah chapter 40. I want you just to listen. I think you're going to get excited in just a moment. And you may already know this, but it's just going to be like a light bulb going off, and you're going to say, wow, I never saw it that way. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he faints not, neither is he weary. There's no searching or completely understanding him. He gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases his strength. Even at times the youth will faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But, everyone say but. But. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and shall not faint. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew. Everyone say renew, please. Renew. They shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. And they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not fall. Or faint. The rising with the mounting of the wings of eagles, I think, has to do with teaching the young how to fly. Another one was teaching, I'll, I'll never forget this story. Uh, there was a guy that was a hand glider uh, guy, and you know, they would jump off the mountains in California. You can literally, you're driving down the interstate and see a man run right off a mountain with a, 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 a hand glider that he's holding on to. Now one day he said, I read this in the Reader's Digest, he said he was way up there and he came down and he got in a downdraft and the wind was just crashing him and he didn't know what to do. I'm going to die. I'm going down. I can't control this thing. 
And he looked over and he saw an eagle. And he saw how the eagle was not fighting, but handling the wind and allowing the wind to guide it. He just started doing what the eagle did. It came right out of that thing. Oh, how powerful it is. If you study the life of an eagle, you will find the life of a Christian. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Their sight, their power, all of it's incredible. He says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, I spoke to you last week and for a couple of weeks now about Psalms 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And it goes on to say he'll cover you with his wings. I'm sure you can tie that into Isaiah 40. But he, he makes this statement, if you dwell in the secret place with me, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to cover you. You're going to find strength. Even when you're weak, you're going to find strength. Are you hearing me? And so as I was walking in the bedroom, I, I, my, I mean my office, it used to be a bedroom, I began to pray and say, God, what is the word that we have for today? And the Lord spoke to me and said, you, David, you, Church, out of all the timings of God's perfect will and way. Think about this. Uh, tells the disciples, get, get in the water, go to the other side. And then he had to, in the perfect timing, be walking past the boat. Are you hearing me? It goes on and on. It's all over your Bible. And he says to me, you, David, my church, you are the one that gets, has the privilege to set the timing of heaven's visitation with you. Did you hear what I just said? Out of all that goes on in the timing of God, he says, I'm laying in your hands the timing of my visitation. You set your own time and I will be there. How cool is that? This past Sunday, I was there with Joyce and uh, uh, Bridget and, and um, Nikki before service. This Sunday, or this Monday, we have Monday night prayer meeting here. We have Monday night prayer meeting online. And, and uh, you know, I get on there and sometimes there's 10, 15 people. Sometimes, I don't know, 6, 8, it, just a variety of people come online with us. And I just pray whatever comes to my heart or whatever they type on the page. Excuse me. And Sunday, or Monday, excuse me, I go in my office and I had one of those days. You ever had one of those days? I had no time for prayer. I had no time for Bible. I had no time to even think for myself. It was like from the moment you get up, you're going to run wide open all the way to prayer meeting. I walk in there and I said, God, I'm not real spiritual right now. In five minutes, I'm going to hit the go button on that phone. And they're going to expect me to touch heaven. And God, I hadn't even been near heaven today. Anyone ever felt that way? Yes. And then he spoke my heart. And I believe it was him. So I, I responded. He said, David. Just come to me as a son. You don't have to be all this or all that. You're my son. I'm your father. Just come to me as a son to a father. And guess what? I will be there. And I don't know who all was online Monday night. But there was a whole lot of crying and a whole lot of Jesus and a whole lot of his presence all over the airwaves that night. I did not start the first prayer until about 35 minutes after I opened my mouth. But the presence of God was so thick, I was overwhelmed. And when I, I left my office and I went in the other room where Sister Tammy was, 
She said, wow. <laughs> My knees were shaking. Here's why. Because I set the time for God to show up. Everything in his world is about timing in his will. But you can set the time. Anytime you want. You can say this is a divine appointment for you, God, and me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He can be thinking before the creation of the world. And you're able in your home to say, God, in about 10 minutes, I'd like you to meet me in the back room so we can talk. He said, you got it, and I won't miss that appointment. You see, what the church has entered into, I think, is the repetitious prayer life, which I'm not saying, I, I'm not trying to say when we say the same thing, we're repetitious. But what I'm saying is if we get in a habit, we better be careful that we never spend time to wait in his presence. We never spend time to say, God, would you come and, and, and be with me? And I wrote that down. I said, what is his expectation of our time with him? And usually it's just centered around the way we do it every time. How about we make a shift and say, God, I'm setting the appointment for you and I just to sit down together and the creator of the universe, because you set the time, is going to come right to where you are and hang out with you. And before you know it, you will be overwhelmed with his goodness and his glory. You'll cry a mess, you'll look a mess, and you'll tell somebody, me and Jesus had a good time. And they'll say, well, that's nice. And you'll say, you don't get it, do you? The creator of this world is that fast to accept my invitation of an appointed time. He said that to me today. He said, David, my church can set the appointed time and I will be there. I'll never miss an appointment. He said, but they must be willing to wait. They must be willing to stop the repetitiveness. Are you hearing me? They must be ready just to slow down and say, God, would you just come? I mean, I wonder what would happen if we just, you know, because we get in those habits and we're creatures of habit. I mean, when I go to a restaurant, I order the same thing every time. It's crazy. One restaurant even created their own menu for me because I ordered the same thing. And so we'll sit down and we'll say, I'm going to read my Bible for 20 minutes, then I'm going to pray for 20 minutes, or 30, or 5, or 1. Well, I'm going to pray in the car. Well, I pray all day long. I'm good with those things. But praying all day long, and even listening to the Word, or reading the Bible all day long, cannot replace the time where you shut the world down, and we shut our mouth, and just say, Jesus. I'm here. Would you meet me? Think about it. Israel had to wait for him to show up at the timing that God says, now, now, now. The, the, the early church had to wait in the upper room for the timing of the Holy Spirit to show up. Ten days later, a ten-day prayer meeting, they're sitting around waiting, and here comes cloven tongues and the wind and fire, and it fills them, and they speak into the tongues, and the glory of God fills the place, and we're saying, oh, man, it is so good, and Peter goes out, and 3,000 get saved, and then his shadow is touching the sick, and wow, 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 God, I want you to do all that in me. And God is saying, you set the appointed time. I've already poured the Spirit out. You set the appointed time. You sit in my presence. You wait on me and I will come and strengthen you. I'll take away your fear and your weakness. And when you come out of that place of intimacy, you'll be a power. Last Wednesday, Brian spoke on a lot of things, and the one thing that he said,
said that just jumped into my spirit. He said, don't draw the sword against the enemy until you've first been in the secret place with God. So I go into the office there and I just sit down. I said, okay, Father, Daddy. I never call him Daddy. When you do, it's all right. I need you. I come to you just as I'm your son. Will you be here? And he shows up. Joyce, how many times have you just said, I'm going to pray and God showed up? Bridget, how many times? The list goes on. I can just start asking everybody. We set that. We set the time. We, us, me, I, you. We have the ability to to say to the Father that created all things, I'm setting the time. And do you know he will be there on time waiting? It puts a different perspective when we say, I'm going to pray tomorrow morning, and, and we don't. I'm going to spend some time with the Lord tomorrow, and something happens and we don't. Do you know he was there for the appointment? I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm saying that I believe God is speaking to the church today, worldwide, and saying, come into the secret place with me and just dwell with me. Let me show you what I want you to read. Let me show you how I want you to pray. Let me show you what I want you to say. Let me cover you with my wings and my presence. Let me bear you up and strengthen you. Do you know, when I am closing, this world can attack a lot of things. It can say there's so much stuff that's wrong and fanatical and about religion. But nothing can take away the place of your intimacy with God. As a matter of fact, I'll be bold enough to say this. I don't know one single person in all the years of my life that, that spent time in those places of intimacy, the secret place, set the appointment and just spent that time with him. I don't know any single person that did that that walked away from I know lots of people that came to the altar and got slammed and hit and fell and shook and spoke in tongues and, you know, God blessed them and they were on fire, excited, screaming, yelling, preaching and everything else. But I want you to know, if you don't spend that time that you appoint, he can also appoint it. It's all right. I think we have a woman's meeting scheduled this Saturday. Since Tam and I thought we were two weeks out, so we really blew the face the bulletin on that one. We apologize. But this month has slipped away. But there's an appointed time this Saturday. They know when we go, he's going to show up. Amen. It wasn't like some boisterous, thus saith the Lord, the first Saturday of every month. Call that sisters in Christ. There's impressions, there's thoughts, there's ideas, but there's his faithfulness always. So I want to encourage you tonight, set the appointment with him. Turn the TV off. Shut things down and say, it's me and you. It's me and you. I look sometimes... And I, I shared this the other day, and I'm going to finish with this. One of the most powerful books I ever read for my walk with God was Good Morning, Holy Spirit of Ben Hinn. Some people look at it as a controversial book, but it's just about the Holy Ghost. And he spent so much time in his younger years creating an atmosphere in his bedroom in prayer. 
He had run home from school as fast as he could. He wasn't going to go play basketball or hang out with the neighbor kids. He wanted to hang out with the Holy Spirit. That's what he did. Two, two significant things I remember he wrote, wrote in the books. And one time he was, he was in there kneeling down. And they called him for dinner as a young boy. And he got up to go eat. And the Holy Spirit said, Benny, can you just spend a little more time with me? You know, how would you like that? You go to that secret place and you, you, know, you just feel a little bit and it's all good. And you feel the Lord and you're loving on Jesus. And you feel his spirit touching. And you get up to leave and you hear a voice say, can you stay a little bit longer? Ooh, that'll make you cry. Another time he came out of that room walking down the hallway and his unsaved mother walked past him and she hit the floor. She couldn't even stand in the presence of God that was around him. Moses came out of the mountain. The presence of God around him was strong. I think the church is being called back to the secret place. Back to a place of intimacy. Get out of the repetition and say, Lord, I'm going to sit with you a while. So would that sing that song that I so butchered beautifully? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Mold me and make me after your will. While I'm waiting, yielded and still. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? I hope that speaks to someone, those on Facebook. Hey, I do have an announcement that's very important. Um, Thursday night, tomorrow night at 6.30 is our first Toys for Talks meeting. Everyone and anyone that's going to be a part of it, please spread the word. We're going to meet here at the building, 6.30, Amy, is that what it is? Yes. 6.30. Tomorrow night. Uh, so encourage people. Uh, um, we didn't get a lot of announcements on that, so we're trying to get the word out as much as we can, so if anyone, if you're on Facebook, please share, that, uh, and Sister Tammy put it on Facebook, so please share that, that let people know, and we're going to minister this year to some people, and we'll see what God does, amen? amen? Father, I thank you for your word, bless each one, let us grow in you, let us spend time under your wings, and in your very presence, in an intimate way, in Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen. amen. If you have an offering, the baskets are up front. We love you. God bless each one of you. Uh, somebody's next, shake somebody's hand, and let's say, don't want you to. You are. Yes. <laughs> because you have new rings, I see.